Come and make yourself at home. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor, and good morning. It is an honor for me to be back in South Gastonia and to preach for you. I started to suggest to him I was coming and I could preach, but I thought I'd just let God work things out, you know. And uh, he texted me and uh, asked, and I was glad to be able to come and to have my wife with me. She does hang close around that grandbaby now, and I do have a picture if you want to see it. I've learned how grand, grandparents always pull out pictures of the grandbaby. I didn't know that before. People told me, but I hadn't experienced it. And uh, I like it when the baby cries, it's not my baby, <laughs> it's your baby. The baby messes the diaper, not my baby, that's your baby. So <laughs> but we're having a wonderful time with, uh, with the new grandchild. We thank God for it. I thank God for you. What a wonderful, I don't want to call it a bastion, but what a wonderful wonderful repository of the Spirit of God. Yes. You know, I get to visit a lot of churches, and you don't feel this freedom to worship that you feel here at South Gastonia. You have something special here, and you ought to be proud of it. It's you. It's because of you. There's nothing about this building that makes it that way. It's about the people and the pastor. And you know I love your pastor and his wife, even though she went on vacation rather than hear me. I don't hold it against her in any way. <laughs> She did have supper with me last night before she left, so I appreciated her waiting long, long enough for that. But I do have great confidence and respect and admiration for your pastor. I honestly did not believe that he'd make a good pastor. He was such a great evangelist. I didn't think he could settle down and be a pastor, but he, he said you could be evangelist and pastor. And he kept that evangelistic fire and fervor that Brother Gilly is known for and just appreciate him so very much and the opportunity to be with you this morning. Are you ready to hear a word from the Lord? I appreciate the songs that were sung by Colin and the uh, trio that sang went right along with the message today. If you have your Bibles, would you turn to John chapter 5, verses 1 to 6. This is one of those stories that we hear a lot, have read a lot, every one of you know this story. I hope I can share with you some things that God has laid on my heart from this text. I'm going to ask you to stand, if you will, for the reading of God's Word and also for prayer. John chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first, after the stirring of the water, was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there, and knew that he had already been in that condition a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? And I want to use that question as my message today. Do you want to? Do you want to? Do you want to? Want to? Can I tell you God is ready if we're ready. He is more ready to bless us than we are to be blessed. He is more ready to revive us than we want to be revived. He is more ready to do for us and to meet our needs than we want to. Do you want to? Father, I thank you for the presence of your spirit that is in this house today. Thank you for these blessed people of God who love you and worship you in spirit and in truth for this pastor who leads them, Father, for this congregation. I just pray your blessings now upon this message, these next few moments. Would you anoint me, Father? I cannot preach unless you touch me and anoint me. And I pray for that divine unction that comes only from heaven to come down on me and upon this congregation. And God, would you do a work in this church today like you did at the Pool of Bethesda over 2,000 years ago. In Jesus' name, we commit this service and ourselves into your hands, and we'll give you all the honor and the praise and the glory. And everyone said, Amen. 
Amen. You may be seated. You know, we have a victim mentality in the world today. People who think that they're always the victim. And how many of you, if you were a child, you were the last one picked to be in a ball team. Or if you go to the grocery store, you always get in the longest line. Or always seems you're at the longest light. The red lights always stop you. Some people say if it wasn't for bad luck, I wouldn't have any luck at all. And they always feel, feel like they're on the short end of the stick. But here's what I want to say to you this morning. Is don't let your history interfere with your destiny. Do you hear me this morning? Don't let what has happened to you in your past interfere with what God wants to do for you in the future. There's a picture I want to show up on the screen, one of my favorite. I don't know how many of you can see that. <laughs> see the road kill in the road and the painters just painted right over it. So it's not my job. And there are a lot of people today who refuse to accept responsibility for themselves. They want to blame somebody else for what's happened to them, blame somebody else for what's going on in their lives. There is a philosophy, a counseling philosophy called focus therapy counseling. And one of the main questions that the counselor asks the client is, what are you going to do about your situation? Invariably, the client says, somebody else ought to do something. And they refuse to assume personal responsibility. It's easier to look for a rescuer than to assume responsibility. We want somebody else to do what we can do for ourselves. But I'm telling you, we are a participant in our lives, not just a casual observer. We don't just sit back and let things happen. We are participating. And I'm telling you, we can do more about our situations if we want to. Do you want to this morning? Do you want to change? Do you want to make a difference in your life? It's really not a new counseling technique. In fact, it's one that Jesus used. And as we follow the course of this brief encounter between Jesus and this man at the pool of Bethesda, I think that he's speaking the same message to us that he did to the lame man. Number one, I want you to notice a crazy question. I want you to consider this situation. The pool of Bethesda had five porches. It was on the east side of Jerusalem near the fortress of Antonium. The water source was a nearby spring, and according to the Bible, there was an angel that would come down and stir the water, and the first person in the water after the angel stirred it would be healed. And the Bible tells us there was a multitude laying there on those porches, a blind and lame and paralyzed, watching the water, hoping to be the first one in. It's kind of like a healing lottery. Do you hear what I'm saying? They're waiting for their time, their chance to hit the healing lottery. And here's a man sitting or laying at this pool. There were no wheelchairs. It wasn't handicap compliant. It's only the mercy of others. He depended on others to get him there. He depended on others to give him coins or bread as he lay there. He depended on others to get him back home. He was always dependent on somebody else day after day, month after month, year after year, hoping for the day when he'll win the lottery. He has about him all the paraphernalia of a crippled man. He had a bed or a mat to lie on. He had an offering plate for the coins that somebody would drop in. He wasn't as bad off as others. Can you imagine being a blind person watching for the water? The blind people couldn't even see if the angel touched the water. So he wasn't as he was in bad shape, but he, there was always somebody in worse shape than you are. Do you hear me this morning? And Jesus comes to this man. Now, I can't tell you why Jesus chose him. I can't tell you why, of all the multitude of impotent folk, why did he come to this man? But I can tell you, Jesus knew something about him that he didn't know himself. And I cannot tell you, God knows more about you. I can't tell you why he heals some instantaneously and why he heals others progressively. But I do know that he's God and he knows what he is doing. And he came to this man and he found out he'd been there for 38 years. That's 13,870 years. Days. Now, we wonder sometimes if God doesn't answer in 38 seconds or give him 38 minutes or maybe 38 hours or 38 weeks. 
days, months, and 38 years, he had not had an answer for his situation. And Jesus comes to him and asks him the question, do you want to get well? It was a crazy question. I could just imagine if it'd be one of us, what do you think I'm doing laying here? I haven't laid here for 38 years if I didn't want to be healed. I can imagine some of us making other excuses. Who do you think I am? Somebody would say, do you think the Pope is Catholic? <laughs> do you want to get well? Now I want you to know Jesus and ask him, how did you get here? He'd ask him, why are you here? All he asked him was, do you want to get well? Hallelujah. I'm telling you today that God is looking at us today and asking us, do you want to get well? Can I tell you that God doesn't ask questions because he lacks information? <laughs> He's the omniscient God. He knows all about us. He knows what's happened in the past. He knows what's going on in the present. He knows what the future holds. And he doesn't ask questions because he doesn't already know the answer. He asked the question to get us to begin to think about exactly what the core issue is. He knew that this man had been here for 38 years, and he knew he was used to being a dependent. He was used to having others do for himself. And Jesus said, here's the issue. Do you really want to get well? Are you ready to leave the mat? Are you ready to leave the pool? Are you ready to leave receiving and be a giver? Are you ready to be independent and work a job and take care of yourself instead of having been taken care of? Healing brings with it a price. A man crippled for 38 years had always relied upon others. And if he were to get well, he would have to take responsibility for himself. So Jesus' question actually peers to the very center of the man's heart as he does our. Was he still trying to get in the water? After 38 years, had he given up? Had he decided, well, it's never going to happen to me. It's always going to happen to somebody else. Had he found him a nice, comfortable place in the shade that was reserved for him too far from the water to get in when it was troubled. We don't really know. The Bible doesn't tell us those questions. But Jesus knew. And can I tell you, he knows your need today. And oh, as I was praying about this message this morning, I could see this church as being the pool of Bethesda. Many folks here today who are blind to their own problems, blind to their own needs, blind to their own situations, lame and crippled because of past hurts or past problems or past circumstances in their life till they can't do anything for God today. And what Jesus is saying to you this morning, he is asking, that, asking you as he asked that blind man, do you want to be made hell? Are you ready to come out of your dependency, come out of your problem and get to be what God wants you to be? Praise God. Do you want to let go of the past? Mm. Help us, Father, today. Do you want to? Here's the problem. Many of us are crippled by past hurts. It could be abuse in your childhood. It could be somebody in the church that said something you didn't like that hurt you and that has bothered you for years. It could be something some family member said, some neighbor said, some person said to you that you still can't get over it. When I was pastoring in Shelby, we had a dear sister. You didn't dare ask her what was wrong with her. Or you'd be there the next 30 minutes as she told you everything that was going on with her. I'm talking about many people today are crippled and carry around a lot of garbage, spiritual and emotional and perhaps even physical, that needs to be discarded once and for all as garbage. What are you talking about? I'm talking about broken relationships. I'm talking about past hurts. I'm talking about envies and jealousies and unconfessed unconfessed sins. Do you want to be delivered is what Jesus is saying today. These are things that hinder our testimonies and hinder our service because we let things that have happened in the past interfere with our destiny and what God has in store for us. Corrie ten Boom was a Dutch lady who hid Jews in her home when they were captured by the Jews and her and her family was put in a Nazi concentration camp. Her family died in the camp. She was released by the Allies when they defeated the Germans, and she was on the speaking circuit, and she was speaking one night about forgiveness. And at the end of the service, 
as she came down from the podium and was shaking people's hands, she saw a man that she recognized from the prison, a prison guard who had carried a leather strop and had beaten her and other prisoners. She had seen his cruelty, and she saw as he made his way down through the crowd to her, and when he got to her, he said, Fraulein, that was a tremendous message on forgiveness. Now, will you forgive me? And he stretched out his hand. She said, it came all over me. I had seen the cruelty of this person. I had seen what he did to me and what he did to my sisters. I remember the joy with which he did it. And now here, he's asking me to forgive him. She went through all the emotions of how can I possibly forgive him and forget what he had done for me. And she said, God, I can't do it to herself. She said, God, I can't do it in myself. But she wouldn'tly raised her hand, and she said when she grabbed his hand, she felt the love of God just flow through her into him. And that's what I'm telling you. You've got to let it go. Some of you are carrying things you've got to let go. Do you want God to deliver you? Do you really want him to take it away? Do you really want him to make everything all right? There are several ways we deal with garbage in our lives. Sometimes we can either have deliverance or we can ignore it. <laughs> in Matthew chapter 7, verses 3 to 5, Jesus said, Why behold the mote that is in your brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of your eye, and behold, a beam is in your own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. You see, we like to ignore it. We like to walk around it. It's like people see a piece of trash in the hallway or on the carpet and walk around it. It's not my job. And we will ignore problems in our own lives. Jesus said, you've got a, you have a log in your eye, and you try to pull out a speck out of somebody else's eye. He said, take care of the log in your own eye before you deal with somebody else's problems. And I'm, that's what I'm saying. We ignore it, hoping it will go away. It's amazing to me how some parents will put up all kinds of things with their children, and they'd say about somebody else's child, if that was my child, I wouldn't let them get by with that. Well, they can completely ignore their child's misdeeds and their child's miserable. But we sometimes just ignore the garbage in our lives. It's somebody else's job. But ignored garbage does not go away. It just piles up until it becomes a bigger problem. This happens in marriages. There's a problem in the marriage between the husband and the wife. Maybe an argument or something. And you hope it will go away and things may settle down. But then the next argument, that comes back with the new problem, and they keep adding on hostility. You cannot ignore your garbage and just hope it goes away. It's got to be brought to the altar and laid it there and let Jesus take it away once and for all. Secondly, you can dump it sometime. You can either have deliverance or dump it on somebody or something else. How many of you remember Flip Wilson, the black comedian? And what was his favorite line? The devil made me do it. And sometimes we like to blame somebody else, blame the devil, blame our parents, blame the pastor, blame somebody else. In Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 2, Jesus said, What mean ye that you use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. Notice what God says in Ezekiel 18, verses 3 and 4. As I live, saith the Lord God, you shall not have occasion any more to use this proverb in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. We will all give an account of ourselves to God. But ever since the Garden of Eden, when we are caught, we blame somebody else. Who did Adam blame? It was the woman you gave me, God. He blamed Eve. Who did Eve blame? She blamed the serpent. And that's what we do. We try to blame somebody else rather than accepting our own responsibility. Moses, when God called him to deliver the Israelites out of Egypt, he had excuse after excuse after excuse. And you can blame anybody you want to, but can I tell you, eventually it will come back home where it belongs. You can either have deliverance or you can blame somebody else. Third thing we do with it is we recycle it. We've got these stories rehearsed. You know, we live in a recycling society. We recycle our garbage. We recycle everything, but it's not a new thing. Churches have been recycling it for years. I dare say there's some here today who could tell you what a pastor five pastors removed from Brother Gilly did <laughs> that you didn't like. If we can recycle hurts, recycle problems, recycle difficulties, and we just 
Turn it over, over and over and over again. We memorize our stories, and it's the same story every time. It may have happened years ago or months ago or even a week ago, but we've rehearsed it until we can repeat it verbatim every time. But recycling past hurts and past sins and past failures is like picking the scab off of a sore. It opens it up for reinfection and hinders the healing process. Here's the deal. We need to learn from the mistakes of the past. We need to learn from the hurts of the past and then let it go. Take what you can let, let what you can learn and throw the other stuff away. Not recycling. Again, Corey Tin Boom. She said, God not only casts our sins into the sea of forgetfulness, he erects a sign that says, No fishing. Can I tell you, whatever your sins were in the past, they are gone. Never to be remembered against you. Again, and if you try to bring him up to God, he says, what sins are you talking about? Hear me, I thank God for what he did for me, what he saved me from. But hear me, I am so much more happy today about what he's doing for me now and what he's preparing for me in the future. I don't have to talk about where I was. I need to talk about where I am and where I'm going, praise God, and not live in the past, but live in the future and live to what the destiny that God has for me. But so many people just simply recycle it. And hear me, if you say you forgive, you should never bring it up again. It should be gone. That's what we want him to do. And he said, you need to forgive. If you want him to forgive you, you must forgive others also. A fourth way we deal with it is we forget it. <laughs> we just forget that there's a problem until something triggers it again. It happens sometimes in our refrigerators, you know. You put leftovers in the refrigerator. Those get pushed back as more leftovers come in. It gets pushed back to the back till at some point you open that refrigerator door and there's a foul odor coming. And you wonder, what is it? And you open it up and you can't even tell what it was because of the mold or the stuff that's in it. And sometimes we do that in our lives. We'll try to forget about past sins, forget about unconfessed sins, forget about hurts, but it will stink up sometime. It will come back. You cannot simply forget it. Our problem is we remember things we should forget and forget things we should remember. What did David said? Psalm 103, verses 1 to 5. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. Garbage forgotten is like food left in the refrigerator. It will stink. It will come back. Another way we deal with it is we hide it. You know, we are the master mind. We can come to church with a smile. That hides all that stuff behind. How many of you had an argument with your wife today, but you came to church with a smile? Nobody raised their hand. Huh? So, so, I wouldn't admit it either. <laughs> but we did hide it. Sweep it under the carpet. Put it in the corner. Put it out of sight. But what will happen to garbage that is hid? It will build up, and it will come out. When I was a single man, I had to give the appearance that I was a good housekeeper. But if you looked under the bed at the dust bowls or you got real close to the furniture, you'd see the dust collected. If you looked at the kitchen trash can, it was probably full to overflowing. But you cannot just hide it. You cannot just let it go. In Numbers 32, 23, the Bible says, Be sure your sin will find you out. David tried to hide his sin. You know the story. He committed adultery with Bathsheba. So what did he do? He tried to cover it up. He had Uriah put on the front line of the battlefield until he was killed, and then he married Bathsheba. But although he may have fooled some of the people, he did not fool God. And when the prophet came to him, he pointed his finger in his face, said, You are the man. You cannot hide your sins. You may hide it from this pastor. You may hide it from some of the members, but you cannot hide it from God. It will come for him. So what do you do with garbage? You've got to learn to deal with it. Don't ignore it. Don't dump it. Don't recycle it. Don't forget it. Don't hide it. Decide what is garbage is not and what is not. Separate the good from the bad. What can I learn? What can I use? And refuse to let it control you. 
What's controlling your mind today? Some of you, I dare say, know exactly what I'm talking about. Something you've been carrying and harboring in your heart. It's time to deal with it. And God is asking you this morning, do you want to? Do you want to let it go? You see, we want to hold on. But the Bible says, vengeance is mine. I will repay. You may have been wrong. Somebody may have done you wrong. But you just need to turn it over to Jesus. Let Jesus take care of it. Not take it in your own hands. Let it go. Deal with it. Let Jesus be in charge. Do you want to? Do you want to let go that ill feeling? Do you want to let go that hurt? Do you want to let go that that's holding you back? Somebody say, well, they hurt my feelings. Big deal. You probably hurt somebody else's feelings. They said something I didn't like. Big deal. You probably said something somebody else didn't like. We've got to learn to deal with it. And then finally, we need to just leave it. How many of you have taken things to the curb for the garbage and went back out and got it before the garbage truck came? <laughs> but that's what happens at church. We will bring it to the altar and we'll take it from the altar. We'll bring it down, get prayer, and then we walk right back out with it. But can I tell you, you've got to get to the place where you leave it there. Like that old song says, leave it there, leave it there. Take your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. Praise God. And trust him with it. There was a Jewish physician named Viktor Frankl who was arrested by the Nazis also. They killed his wife, his children, and his grandparents. They confiscated all of his possessions. And one day as he was standing in line, one of the guards, particularly mean guards, saw that he still had his wedding band. It was the last possession he had. The guard said, hold out your hand. He held his hand, and the guard with glee sneering at him pulled his wedding band off. And it was at that moment that he realized that you can take everything from me that you possibly can, but this one thing. You cannot take away my freedom to choose how I will respond to you. Hear me. We cannot prevent things from happening to us. Bad things will happen. It's not what happens to us. It's what happens to what happens to us. We have to make a decision. Bad things happen to all people. I cannot explain to you today why my first wife died of leukemia, but God has blessed me with another wife and two more beautiful children. God knows what He's doing. We just need to leave it there. What about us? As Jesus looks at us this morning, crippled by problems, crippled by past hurts, crippled by past circumstances, he asks the question, do you want to get well? Is it easier to hold on the hurt? Is it easier to let that bitterness fester? Is it easy to wallow in the hurt and betrayal, licking and liking our wounds? So the question isn't crazy at all as it echoes down through the ages. Jesus said, do you want to get well to the one crippled? He said, do you want to let it go? Do you want me to take it? To those with secret sin, he says, do you want to be loose? Those who are bound by addiction, he says, do you want to be set free? Those who are lost, he says, do you want to be saved? And it's up to us. The second thing I want you to notice is a crazy question. But it was a lame excuse. And no pun intended. <laughs> he was lame. <laughs> he said, sir, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. And while I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. You see, he didn't answer Jesus' question at all. He said, I don't have anybody to help me. He made an excuse. And hear me, you'll be guilty of that same thing today if you don't let Jesus have it. He said, do you want to be healed? But they hurt me. But it still hurts. He said, do you want to be healed? Do you want to be made whole? He didn't answer the question, do you want to get well? It amounts to an excuse. To say there's no one to help me means I can't help myself and God's not doing anything about it either is what he was saying. But when Jesus asked you, do you want to be healed? He knows how bad they hurt you. He knows what people said. He knows your hurt and anger. They said bad things about him. But he wants to know, do you want to be made whole? He will ignore your excuses. He will ignore the hurt. 
He will ignore the pain. He just said, do you want me to do what needs to be done in your life? That's the question this morning. And then thirdly, an impossible instruction. Verse 8 of that chapter. Jesus says to him, rise, take up your bed, and walk. I want you to notice this. He tells him, it doesn't say that he touched him, it doesn't say that he helped him, I suspect. Jesus lifted a hand. He wasn't slain in the spirit. He didn't fall out, but he felt healing. Jesus said, rise up and walk. He said, I don't have anybody, but Jesus was there. He didn't even realize it. You may say, I don't have anybody, but you've got